Hello and cheers everyone and welcome to Science on Tap here at the Kiggins. I am Chris Gowan and I'm going to be your host for this evening as we listen to a talk on the science of adult attachment, uh, understanding our patterns in relationships. So now, uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Leah Haas to the stage to talk more about attachment theory. And yeah, you're gonna get a little bit more insight into some of these apparently really hard trivia questions. And, and uh, it possibly, I was biased in making these because I've known Leah for many, many years and Leah and I uh, are colleagues and often talk about this kind of stuff and I, I love hearing her speak and I love this topic. So let's welcome Leah Haas. Hello, everybody. It's, oh, hi. <laughs> I am so excited to be here and to be talking about one of my favorite topics in the world, uh, relationships and adult attachment. Um, and oh, I need to get my little clicker. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself because many of you probably do not know who I am. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about myself because we're going to be spending um, about an hour together talking about attachment. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little background about who I am and kind of what brought me here to be giving this talk about relationships. So, um, well, first of all, I'm from Portland, born and raised. And um, I am a sex educator. I actually started working in sex education about 13 years ago, um, working for the state of Oregon, implementing a sixth grade sex ed curriculum, um, which I still work for. And actually, we're, we're going to be rolling out an eighth grade curriculum next school year. So a lot of what I do is um, work with teachers and school administrators and high school peer educators to um, support the implementation of middle school sex ed um, across the state of Oregon. Um, I love sex education. That is one of my first passions in life. And um, Chris and I, who did that amazing trivia, um, actually started um, Beyond the Talk, which is an organization that focuses on sex education for adults because I think there's a big gap in our sex education, right? Like many of us did not get high quality, comprehensive sex ed when we were growing up and we have a big gap to fill. Um, and so Chris and I really appreciate focusing on adult sex education, which this relationship stuff really falls under, you know, sex education. We're so lucky to have um, healthy relationships being taught to um, young people in their sex education. And so many of us did not get a whole lot of education on relationships. So we've been trying to figure it out by trial and error. And um, it's been hard, you know. So I think that this framework that we're going to be talking about today um, should help all of us learn more about ourselves and relationships and kind of fill in some of the sex education gaps that we may have. Um, another thing about myself is that I am a clinical social worker and I love mental health work. I specialize in working with people um, needing support with sexuality and gender and relationships. Um, and I was trained in a somatic um, therapy practice. I also love mindfulness. So those are some of the approaches that I use in my practice. Um, so those are some of the professional things about me. Um, some other things about myself, since you know we're going to be spending this time together that's outside of work, is I, I love to sing. I love to um, try to play the guitar. It's not always easy. Um, and I got really into backpacking over COVID when things shut down and it was harder to do a bunch of stuff and travel. I uh, got really into going out into the woods and finding the best place for my hammock. Um, and going out into to nature with my partner and our dog. And those are some things about myself. So um, now you know a little bit about me. I know that there are some people in the audience and friends and family who already know me, but um, hopefully now you know me just a little bit better. Um, but I also, and let's make sure I can figure out, I really struggle with technology. That's another thing you should notice, you should know about me. 
Um, okay, so I also want to share more about why I love adult attachment theory so much. Um, I love it so much because it was introduced to me um, when I was really struggling with my own relationships. I was kind of encountering the same patterns over and over again. I was feeling really stuck. I was feeling really confused. Um, and I felt really alone in my patterns, as if, you know, I was the only one in the world experiencing what I was experiencing. Um, and I had a therapist um, introduce the book Attached by Amir Levine and Rachel Heller. And I started reading the, this book and learning about attachment theory. And I was just like, whoa, this is really blowing my mind. It, it's really helping me make sense of my own experience. And I'm feeling less alone. And I'm feeling like maybe there's some solutions to what I keep encountering in my relationships. Uh, so I started taking this book around to uh, parties with my friends because there was an assessment in the book. <laughs> And I was like, hey, do you want me to assess your attachment style? And my friends would be like, yeah. Am I right, Lainey? I, I'm pretty sure I, I assessed you. Um, so it became like the ultimate party trick, uh, doing these assessments and helping my friends also figure out their attachment styles. Um, so what I've come to really appreciate about adult attachment theory uh, is just how helpful it's been for me, how helpful it's been for my friends, um, and, you know, working in private practice with clients, I have become a bit of a dating coach, really helping people kind of move their, through their attachment patterns and kind of make sense of their experience so that they can move towards um, more secure attachment in their relationships. So, okay, oops, wrong way, hey, okay, so here is the overview of the evening. This is what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about childhood attachment because that really lays the groundwork for getting into adult attachment. So we will also um, talk about strategies for helping to make your relationships more secure. That will be a big chunk of what we talk about today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about breakups because we got to talk a little bit about breakups. And we're going to um, also talk a little bit about uh, dating tips for those of you who are dating and you want some strategies for dating. And we will end with some Q&A. I hope that you find a nugget of wisdom from this presentation, something you can take home with you and work on. You know, this work is not easy, it's not fast. You know, um, you may need to, to work with a therapist or read more about this topic. So I just wanna manage your expectations that this presentation will not heal you and your relationship woes. So in case you were thinking that this presentation would do just that, uh, you may need to put in more work and work with uh, a professional and get some support moving through whatever's coming up for you. Because we're talking about patterns, and patterns are so deeply rooted in who we are and our life experiences, and sometimes we need a little bit of support to move through our patterns. Okay, so. This is a picture of a place that is near and dear to my heart. Um, it is um, from a hiking trail in Kauai. And I wanted to show you this picture because we're going to do a bit of a mindfulness practice. Um, you know, relationships can be kind of triggering. And there may be times in this presentation when you feel a little activated and you could use a little mindfulness support. So we're going to practice kind of going into a bit of a relaxation meditation. This is also, by the way, for me because, hey, I'm up here on stage. This is a little nerve wracking, right? So this is an opportunity for all of us to just take a moment to ground um, and take ourselves to a relaxing place. So your relaxing place could be my relaxing place in Kauai, this beautiful beach, um, the Nepali coast, uh, this hiking trail, there was a waterfall, it was like a perfect 80 degrees, um, the air felt so fresh, right? So it could be something like this. Um, it could be like your bed, maybe for you, your most relaxing place in the world is your bed with all of your pillows and all of your cozy stuff. So I wanna invite you to bring into your mind some sort of place that brings you a sense of relaxation. 
And I'm going to ask you some questions as you think of this place. And go ahead and close your eyes if you feel comfortable with that. If you'd rather keep your eyes open, a, a soft gaze at the ground can be helpful. Um, but if you can, close your eyes and bring this relaxing place into your mind. And when you're in this place, I want you to engage your senses. So noticing what this place looks like and what this place feels like, what it sounds like, what it smells like. Maybe there's a taste involved. And go ahead and take three deep breaths from this place that brings you so much relaxation. Taking a nice deep breath, a nice long exhale that really helps to kick in that parasympathetic nervous system. And whenever you feel ready, open your eyes. And I just want to remind you that you can come back to this place at any time during this talk. If you feel activated, um, if you just need to do some grounding. So, all right, now that we did a little bit of mindfulness, um, let's jump in to our talk about relationships. Is everybody ready? Did anyone fall asleep? Are we all here? Ooh, thank you. And now I got a little bit of vino, so I'm ready. Okay, so let's talk about relationships and why relationships are so important. Well, from one perspective on relationships, relationships have been so important from an evolutionary perspective. We needed relationships to survive from predators, from threats. We were more likely to survive when we were in relationship with other people. It's also important to remember that humans are relational and we're dependent on others from the time that we are in the womb, right? We need the nutrients of you know, the womb and our, our mother, our caregiver, to um, help us grow and you know, become the person, the baby, that we are in this world. And then when we come into this world, we are a blank slate, right? Our brains are ready to you know, be coded and to, be, to learn and, and have those wires you know, in our brains that form through the, the, the way our caregiver takes care of us and the way that they respond to the many, many needs that a baby has. So a baby has hundreds of needs a day, and the hope is that our caregiver is responsive to you know, the majority of those needs. So it's through those relationships that our emotions are regulated because those needs are being met, those physical needs, those emotional needs, and in doing so, it, it regulates our bodies, it regulates our physiology. Um, relationships have the ability to regulate our breathing, our blood pressure, our heart rate, our hormone levels. Um, research from the University of Toronto concluded, you know, if you have a form of, of high blood pressure and you're in a relationship that is, you know, healthy and secure, that that relationship has the ability to lower your blood pressure. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're in a relationship that doesn't feel secure, that doesn't feel healthy, you know, it has the ability to raise your blood pressure, right? So relationships can have a big impact on our health, our health and um, really, you know, affect who we are, why we are the, the people that we are, whether we like it or not, right? So attachment theory uh, research helps us to really make sense of 
um, our patterns and make sense of the way that we are in relationships. So I think this big body of research is really important to really help us make sense of our behaviors, our reactions, our defenses when it comes to you know, the relationship we have with ourselves and the relationship that we have with other people. Okay, so um, here's attachment theory. Um, if we're gonna just to talk specifically about what attachment theory is. So it's the emotional bond between an infant and primary caregiver affects the child's behavioral and emotional development into adulthood. So that is what adult attachment, sorry, attachment theory is. There is the adult version of attachment and there's the childhood version of attachment. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, a, a little bit about both. And um, we're gonna look at some of the researchers that had a big impact on the field of attachment. Now there are so many different researchers who um, have contributed to this body of work um, around attachment, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the major researchers and contributors to this body of work. So um, the first person that, um, Chris mentioned earlier, John Bowlby, um, who was a psychiatrist and is known as the, um, the, the father of childhood attachment, really started to research um, childhood attachment in the 1950s. And he was really interested in the bond between a mother and an infant, and you know, was looking specifically at mothers because it was the 1950s, and we also want to recognize that you know, mothers are not the only primary caregivers. Uh, a primary ca caregiver can be a person of any gender, um, but because it was you know, the 1950s, um, that is sort of where that, um, that uh, research started. Also, you know, a primary caregiver could be um, you know, a grandparent, could be an aunt, could be you know, a family friend, right? There are all sorts of primary caregivers that exist out there, um, but that was where this research kind of started is looking at the relationship between mother and child and was really interested in the separation um, between um, the separation after World War II um, that happens from loss and from um, you know the, the things that would happen during that war that really separated children from their caregivers and was re really looking at you know how does that affect a, a young person how does that affect a child and how does that affect their development. Um, he was also really interested in chronically inadequate parenting, so looked into that as well, um, and partnered with Mary Ainsworth, who um, was the, a student of John Bowlby, and they worked together for 40 years. She's also kind of known as the mother of attachment theory, and she tested uh, John Bowlby's um, theory and wanted to like actually see like so how does this play out? You know, if we were to observe. Um, mothers or caregivers with their infants and kind of see what is happening. So um, Mary Ainsworth um, set up the strange situation test, which I'm going to talk a little about, bit about in just a moment um, to kind of test this theory. Um, so Mary Main was a study of Mary, a student of Mary Ainsworth um, and helped us kind of identify another category of attachment. So Mary Ainsworth identified um, secure, anxious, and avoidant categories of attachment. Um, and Mary Main came around and said, well, wait a minute, there's this fourth category of infants that are not falling perfectly into these other categories. And they were you know, infants who had been um, traumatized, who had experienced abuse, and were not kind of you know, falling into those other categories. So Mary Main identified disorganized attachment as another category of attachment. And the other important thing about Mary Main is she really brought adult attachment theory into focus, right? Not just focusing on what's happening with the development of the infant, but thinking about, you know, how does um, 
our attachment affect our lives throughout adulthood. Um, so Philip Shaver and Cindy Hazan also were really important researchers in adult attachment. Um, and they also um, kind of brought the, the love quiz, um, which was a way to kind of assess people's attachment styles into focus in the 1980s. And that kind of assessment is really important, right? So we can all assess our attachment styles and kind of know where we fall in that. Which, by the way, if you haven't um, checked out your attachment style, at the end of this presentation, I have a link that you can, um, you can go to to figure out your attachment style. Um, I do also want to give a shout out to, um, to Amir Levine and Rachel Heller, who, um, who put out the book Attached in 2010, um, because that really kind of brought this work into uh, kind of a pop psychology phenomenon and made it uh, really accessible um, by putting in a bunch of research into their book and um, just making this uh, theory and this research uh, digestible and understandable. and. Um, this book has really kind of even taken off during COVID. It's been very popular selling a bunch more books during COVID. So people are very interested uh, in attachment and I, and I you know, just have to appreciate Amir Levine and Rachel Heller for their work as well. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the strange situation test. And this, the strange situation test um, was uh, the, the test that Mary Ainsworth um, tested throughout her time as a researcher starting in the 1960s. Um, and she observed um, the uh, stressful se separation between an infant and a mother, which you know later on they were looking at caregivers and being more inclusive. Um, but they would put them in a room together with toys and uh, they would watch an infant that was typically nine to 18 months old and would kind of just observe the mother and the um, infant um, and what would happen in the room. And then the mother would leave the room and a stranger would enter into the room. And the stranger was typically, you know, like a research assistant. And then the research assistant would leave and the mother would come back. So the researchers were really kind of observing that reunion um, between the infant and the mother. And the response to that reunion dictated uh, the attachment style of the infant. So that's how we came to know the secure, anxious, avoidant categories. And later, Mary Main um, helped us uh, categorize that fourth category, disorganized attachment. OK, so now we're going to talk specifically about uh, secure childhood attachment and what that looked like. So um, in the strange situation test, um, we see that many of the infants would kind of explore the room. So there was a very exploratory aspect to these infants. They would play with toys. Um, and when the mother would leave the room, um, the child would become distressed. And when the caregiver would return to the room, the infant would um, be calmed down relatively quickly upon the return of the mother. So um, one of the things that the researchers um, noticed were, was that for the caregivers were essentially warm, they were emotionally attuned, they were uh, you know, available for the many needs of the child, they were safe, they were protective, um, they helped to calm the child's emotions uh, and soothe them, which taught them how to soothe themselves, which is really important for all of us to know how to do. And um, they helped to create a secure base for that infant, you know, so they felt comfortable exploring, you know, the room and then coming back to the caregiver, knowing that they could rely on the caregiver, that they would be there to support them. So um, creating a secure base is so important for, for little ones, you know, for, so that way as, you know, they get older, they feel comfortable going out into the world, exploring and coming back and getting support from their caregiver as needed. Um, so the other thing that they learned about secure childhood attachment is that it supports healthy brain development, um, keeps uh, the stress hormones low, lower, and increases oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. And um, the next category of childhood attachment is anxious attachment. 
And in the strange situation test, um, the baby just like didn't really explore. The baby was very hyper-focused on the caregiver, really just focused on their whereabouts. And when the caregiver would leave the room, you know, the, the baby would become very distressed. And when the caregiver returned to the room, um, the child would be inconsolable. It was very hard to calm them down. And so that was sort of what, what they noticed about an anxiously attached uh, child. And as far as, you know, how the caregivers show up in uh, anxious attachment, the caregivers, like, pretty inconsistent with how they are responding to the child. Like sometimes they're available, emotionally available, physically available, and other times they're not available. Um, so there's kind of a mixture of responses. Sometimes, you know, the caregiver might be intrusive, maybe they're controlling, and sometimes they're just really, you know, not there. And the child starts to feel rejected by that kind of response from the caregiver and becomes really concerned and worried about the level of closeness in this relationship. So they constantly are kind of monitoring um, their caregiver's whereabouts. And they start to develop anxiety about this, um, at, you know, because they don't know, like, are my, are my needs going to be met, you know, um, and they kind of amplify their emotions to get their needs met. So the next category is avoidant childhood attachment. Um, in the strange situation test, this um, baby is typically kind of um, focusing on playing and kind of entertaining themselves, and they don't have much of a reaction to the caregiver leaving the room, the stranger coming into the room, and then the you know parents coming back into the room. They're, they just don't really have much uh, of, a, a, of a reaction. They kind of act as if nothing happened. And what they notice about, you know, avoidant caregivers is that they are typically pretty unresponsive, pretty um, distant, emotionally unavailable, physically unavailable. And just like someone with um, anxious childhood attachment, they can feel like pretty rejected. Um, and the baby kind of learns that, you know, I'm not going to get my needs met, you know, so I'm just not going to have any needs and I'm just going to take care of myself because, you know, I'm probably not going to get these needs met by my caregiver. Um, folks with avoidant attachment styles generally kind of grow up um, with higher levels of stress hormones. It's pr a pretty stressful um, experience um, having, you know, emotionally unavailable, physically unavailable uh, caregivers. And the last category of childhood attachment is this disorganized childhood attachment category. Um, in the strange situation test, we see these um, infants just kind of look frozen. They look dazed. Um, when the caregiver returns, they have all sorts of different kinds of reactions. Maybe they're hitting the caregiver. Maybe they're backing away. Um, maybe they're trying to take care of the caregiver. Like, kind of a range of different uh, responses to the caregiver returning. And they kind of vacillate between anxious um, and avoidant attachment styles. So they have a mixture of uh, attachment responses happening. And um, this is typically um, from some level of trauma from, you know, one or multiple caregivers. Um, maybe their caregiver was neglectful, abusive. Um, basically, the caregiver that is supposed to kind of calm and ease the fears of the um, infant is the one that kind of causes the, the fear. Um, so they really are alone, right, and scared. And um, it can create a, a range of, of different kinds of attachment behaviors um, that can, can last into uh, adulthood, which we will talk about in just a moment. So, um, you know, attachment styles are typically passed down by generation, right? Um, just thinking about the ways that you're being parented by your caregiver or caregivers, right? And then we kind of receive what, that information and those behaviors from our caregivers. And then when we have kids, maybe we do the same thing with them, right? If we're not working on breaking these patterns. Um, so the other thing, and this is something that Chris pointed out earlier in our trivia, um, there's some research from 
from the University of Kansas that tells us that um, our attachment styles are in fact um, partially genetic, right? So this stuff is really, really uh, deeply rooted. Um, and as we talked about earlier, um, you know, the major developmental years for children is zero to seven. Um, so this is when a lot of this attachment stuff is happening and specifically 18 months to three years are major developmental years for attachment. So I think another thing that's really important for all of us to think about when it comes to attachment is that we all have an attachment system in our bodies. And it's sort of like this um, alarm bell that can go off when we're in relationships. Um, an example of that might be, you know, you're expecting your partner to, you know, come home by seven o'clock and they're not home at seven o'clock and now it's nine o'clock. Right? I'm having this whole attachment alarm bell experience happening where I'm starting to have a physiological experience and maybe kind of freaking out, right? So this attachment system develops when we are little and it lasts into adulthood. And for folks with anxious, avoidant, disorganized attachment, our, the, their alarm bells may be, um, you know, extra sensitive. So... We typically remain focused on the emotional and physical whereabouts of our caregivers even into adulthood. And in adulthood, we start to focus also on our partners, right? Romantic partners, dating partners. Um, we kind of shift our focus a little bit. So I do also want to point out that there are other things that can contribute to you know, how we experience uh, relationships with other people, with ourselves, right? There's a lot of different things that can contribute to um, our attachment style. You know, of course, if you have the experience of being adopted or being in the foster care system, right, our experiences with racism, misogyny, sexism, transphobia, right? There's all these different um, systems that are happening that can really um, affect how safe and secure we feel in our bodies and in this world. Um, and so I think that there's more research that is needed kind of looking at our attachment styles and these different um, components that I'm bringing up um, here. Um, but I do think it's important to think about like, yeah, there may be some other things that can affect your attachment style. If you have a really, um, you know, traumatic accident, you know, as you get older, like how does that affect the way that you attach to other people? Um, if you experience divorce, if you experience illness, if you um, grew up moving a lot, if you were just really stressed, right? Like we know that stress can affect our um, attachment styles. We also know that other relationships can have a big impact on us. You know, what about friendships? What about, you know, the relationship we have with grandparents, right? So there's other things that um, I think are worth noting that can affect our attachment style. So... Now let's talk more specifically about adult attachment. And um, as I mentioned before, you know, our, our romantic partners, um, you know, become the focus as we get older for many of us. We kind of move away from being as focused on our primary caregiver or caregivers, and we start to think about dating relationships, you know, sexual relationships, romantic relationships, and that becomes, you know, sort of our source of regulating our emotions and helping us feel more grounded. Um, in adulthood, we still have these same categories of attachment. Um, you know, we still have secure, anxious, Dis, uh, disorganized and um, avoidant. And I put in parentheses some other terms you might hear for these attachment styles. If you start to kind of read this body of research or you're reading books about it, I just want to point out some of these other ways that people ret uh, refer to these attachment styles. I do want to point out that um, attachment styles kind of exist on a continuum, so we don't typically fall neatly into one attachment category. And oftentimes that's because we are raised by um, more than one caregiver. Many people are, right? So if you have 
Um, one parent that you know kind of has more of a, an avoidant uh, attachment style and another parent that has more of an anxious attachment style, like that exists in our bodies and our experiences and our brains, right? So, um, you know, you could try, you could date one person and in that relationship you have more anxious tendencies and you're in another relationship and you've got more avoidant tendencies that pop up. Um, or you date somebody who's secure and suddenly you're feeling more secure, right? So this stuff isn't totally cut and dry and it exists on a continuum. Um, and as we talked about, it is malleable. Your attachment style can change with intention. So um, now I wanna just point out, you know, I, as I've mentioned, it's so helpful to know your attachment style because it helps us under, understand the way that we behave, think, feel, right? And it puts relationships into context. I don't know if anybody's ever wondered like, you know, why does it take me so long to commit when I'm in a relationship? Or why do I commit too soon in a relationship, right? So attachment theory can help us understand those questions and challenge our old beliefs and defenses and fears that we learned as children to survive. We don't need those defenses anymore, right? I mean, sometimes they could be helpful, but a lot of times we need to like mature those defenses and find healthier ones to help really support our relationships. Um, so a, adult attachment theory helps to empower us to change these adaptations, to move towards secure attachment. Um, and I also want to point out that these labels can be really helpful and empowering. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can get overly rigid and attached to these labels and they can keep us kind of stuck. So notice, you know, if it's feeling helpful for you or if it's feeling like maybe I'm overly identifying with this avoidant thing and it's just like keeping me stuck in this avoidant way, right? Like, so to just like, you know, not hold these labels so tight um, and to remember that they, they exist on a continuum anyways. So let's talk specifically about what secure adult at attachment looks like. So if someone has secure adult attachment, they typically have a healthy sense of self. Um, they, they value themselves, they generally um, love themselves, um, they look at themselves in a positive way and other people in a positive way, they're able to identify their feelings, they're able to regulate their emotions, um, relationships feel safe, they want to be in them, they come easily to them, um, they are able to like attuned to their partner's emotions, like, oh, I can tell my partner is feeling upset, you know, I'm gonna check in with them, I'm gonna give them a hug, I'm gonna be there for them, right? So that's that emotional attunement that partners can do for each other. Um, they're able to set boundaries pretty easily and ask for what they need. Um, they're not so worried about compromising themselves or being engulfed in the relationship, probably because you know they're uh, direct, effective communicators. They can share their boundaries and their needs pretty easily. Um, and they do pretty well transitioning from being alone to together in a relationship and kind of riding the ebbs and the flows of a relationship. So that's what um, secure adult attachment looks like. And anxious adult attachment looks a little bit different. So for someone with anxious adult attachment, they typically um, struggle a little bit with, with self-esteem and you know, looking at themselves in a positive way. Um, they oftentimes will put their partner on a pedestal, kind of think more highly of their partner, and struggle to, to feel that way about themselves. They can be overly focused on their partner and their partner's whereabouts, what's happening for them, and less focus on what they need. Um, they worry about what their partner thinks about them. They may really struggle to be alone. Um, they may um, struggle when their partner wants to spend time alone. They can become obsessive and clingy. They may be kind of constantly monitoring the relationship, you know, how the relationship's feeling, what their partner's facial expressions are. Um, and, you know, there, there is actually some uh, research from the University of Illinois that um, 
talks about how folks with anxious attachment are actually pretty good at um, kind of reading affect of their partner. Like, they're, they're like, okay, I can tell my partner's bummed, you know? Like, they're, they're pretty good at figuring that out. Um, but the research tells us that they're not so good if they jump to conclusions right away. So if you know you have an anxious attachment style, take a, take a breath before you jump to conclusions. Um, and that's gonna help you be more accurate um, with reading your partner's affect. Um, because anxious folks, they, they got quite skilled at that when they were babies, um, but take a breath first. Um, anxiously attached uh, adults um, typically use pretty indirect communication, and they're more likely to use protest behavior, um, which we will talk about in just a minute. How's everybody doing? Yeah? You with me? Okay, great. I'm going to talk about protest behavior. Okay, so um, protest behavior is uh, an indirect form of communication, and um, typically it, they're like behaviors um, that take that, that place of that direct communication. So let me give you some example of what that looks like. It could be excessive communication, so that could be like, you know, lots of phone calls, emails, sending you uh, articles, right? A lot of communication, but not typically like kind of getting to the heart of what you're needing and you're feeling, right? So you might use that excessive communication to take the place of um, direct communication. Withdrawing, so let's say you notice that your partner is emotionally distant and you're upset about it, but you don't really know how to talk about it, right? You might just emotionally withdraw um, to try to communicate what's happening for you. Keeping the score, this is another big one. Um, you know, if my partner takes four hours to respond to my text, then I'm gonna take six hours to respond to their text. Right, so that is keeping the score, another form of indirect communication. Um, threatening to leave, right, when you're having a fight. Well, I'll just leave, um, even though you probably don't mean it, you're just trying to hurt them. Um, so that could be another form of protest behavior, acting hostile, aggressive, being mean, abusive. Um, and then making your partner feel jealous. You know, that's, a, that's another strategy um, that some people use in the form of direct, um, in the place of direct communication. So folks with um, anxious attachment styles often typically will use activating strategies. And these are strategies that they use to try to feel some closeness with their partner when they're not feeling very close. Um, there's, there are subconscious strategies that um, help to calm that attachment system and to try to reestablish some security. So here's some examples of activating strategies. Um, getting some form of contact, right? Like if I just see my partner, I'll feel better. I just gotta see my partner. Um, only thinking about the positive qualities of your partner. Making excuses for your partner. Um, hoping that one day your partner is going to change and really kind of holding on to that hope. Um, and believing that this is my only shot at love. If it's not with this partner, it's not going to be with anybody, right? So those are all activating strategies that can keep us kind of locked into that relationship, not wanting to leave, um, and kind of, you know, makes us feel closer to our partner in some way. So this is uh, a from a, an Instagram post from the Mind Geek, uh, who is from Ireland, and I really appreciated this um, Facebook message that we get to see um, on this slide. And this is a really good demonstration of sort of what happens for someone with anxious attachment, and we get to kind of witness the uh, you know attachment system alarm bell going off. I'm hearing some chuckling, so it sounds like some of you are, are reading this. I'm going to read it out loud just because. It's kind of fun to read it. Um, so 7 o'clock, um, this person sends a message. Really wish you didn't have to leave. Miss you already. When are you free again? And thinking inside at 7 o'clock. Low-key insulted and worried you didn't stay the night. Right? So there was some kind of need that wasn't expressed. Right? Um, 707, also funny how, um, funny, how funny was that thing that I said with the words, what a riot, right? So just trying to like make contact. 
uh, at that same time, 707, I can see her online right back to me. So there's that uh, attachment alarm bell going off, um, 7.32. Coffee uh, Thursday sounds great. It's been so long. Yeah, I've missed you too. Uh, 7.32, deploying Operation Wrong Chat, Mission Jealousy. So using uh, one of those protest behaviors, jealousy, and 738, arg, sorry, that was for someone else. Anyway, talk soon, dude, right? And then 738, what the actual bleep, did he bleep? So that's uh, this communication that's happening between 7 o'clock and 738, and we can see, you know, how that attachment alarm bell can really start to go off quickly. Um, and what some of this indirect communication, this protest behavior can look like in, uh, in real time. Has anybody done any of these things before, by the way? I've never done them, ever. Um, okay. So for um, an avoidant uh, attachment style in adulthood, this um, type of attachment style, a person really, really values their independence. Like independence is so important and closeness with other people kind of gets rep repressed, all right? Because it's all about independence, it's all about being self-reliant, acting as if they don't have any needs. Um, they do want close relationships, but have a hard time trusting them. They typically are withdrawn emotionally. They distract from their feelings. They might kind of seem mysterious or secretive. Um, and they're all, they can also be pretty worried or concerned about the relationship future. They are typically pretty critical of their partners, so they're not seeing the positives, they're seeing kind of more of those negatives, and they are kind of known for idealizing past relationships or idealizing future relationships, and maybe even kind of being on the quest to find the one, right? And, and not finding the one, right? The one is this like perfect person that they're, they struggle to find. Um, and they can feel pretty alone when they're in a relationship. I need a sip of a drink, so I'm gonna do that. It's much better. Okay, so um, folks with an avoidant attachment style typically will use deactivating strategies um, to kind of create some emotional distance in their relationships. Um, so these are feelings, thoughts, and behaviors that kind of limit that closeness. Um, and they're strategies to kind of keep their partner um, at an arm's length. So let's look at some examples of what some of those strategies might be. Um, they may just check out emotionally or mentally, right? They may have different ways of doing that. That could be like through technology, um, that could be through watching sports, that could be through, you know, all sorts of ways, right? We've got all sorts of strategies to, to check out. Um, avoiding physical intimacy altogether, not saying I love you because those words feel too close. Um, forming relationships that are not sustainable. So that might be being in a relationship with someone who's already in a relationship and they, you know, that other person doesn't have an open relationship, right? So someone who's not really available. Um, obsession over the one, right? That keep, uh, continues that emotional distance in their relationship and focusing on, on relationship negatives. Okay, so the last style, disorganized attachment, and in adulthood, they kind of, you know, vacillate between the anxious and avoidant attachment styles. Um, they also struggle with low self-esteem, which is something, you know, that folks with insecure attachment generally struggle with. They can be pretty flooded and overwhelmed by emotions, um, and they might resort to self-destructive behaviors to kind of, um, you know, help to soothe those emotions. Um, they, they may use those behaviors, you know, as a coping skill. Um, they think that people are just gonna hurt them, it's hard to trust them, um, and they find it very uncomfortable to rely on other people. Um, they can feel pretty afraid to express their needs, and it's pretty common to have relationship turmoil.
So this is a, a breakdown of attachment styles um, from Amir Levine and uh, Rachel Heller's work. Um, and what we see is about half of the folks that they researched have a secure attachment style. Um, so for those of you who are dating, I think this is important to think about. Um, sometimes I hear people kind of express some frustrations about dating, um, and some of this may kind of explain why. So typically folks with a secure attachment style um, end up in relationships, right? They're not afraid to commit, they, they want to find a long-term partner, um, and they, they are you know, not in the, the dating pool for very long. Um, so the next uh, categories that are pretty common, so 25% of folks have an avoidant attachment style, 20% of folks have an anxious attachment style, and 5% of folks have that disorganized um, attachment style. So it's important to know that, um, you know, if you are dating, there are quite a few people who are uh, insecurely attached. Um, that you may be interacting with and dating, um, especially avoidant folks, um, because uh, it's harder for, for avoidant folks to commit, right? Anxious folks, they, they do want a relationship. They do, maybe they commit too soon, right? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of avoidant people in the dating pool. So something to uh, keep in mind when you're dating and I also think it's important to note, and um, sorry, I'm, I'm sweating. It's a little bit hot up here. Um, so um, as Chris uh, pointed out when we were doing um, trivia earlier, oh my gosh, that's incredible. Um, sure. <laughs> wow, you're my hero. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Ooh. Wow. That's, thank you for uh, attuning to my needs and bringing up this fan. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so um, what the research tells us, I gotta find a good spot for this fan, let's see. It'll bend? Oh my, what can't this do? Oh. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so um, the anxious avoidant dynamic is pretty common when it comes to relationships. Um, so we have some research from the University of Massachusetts and the University of Sa Southampton that found that avoidant individuals actually prefer anxious individuals when dating. And we have another study from uh, the University of Minnesota that showed that anxious women were more likely to date avoidant men. So um, it's interesting, like why would that be? You know, why, why would an anxious person be more inclined to date an avoidant person? And what the researchers believe is that these styles actually kind of complement each other. Um, because they kind of confirm core beliefs that each uh, attachment style has about themselves. So um, for anxious people, it confirms like, I always want more intimacy than my partner. And for an avoidant person, uh, it's my partner always wants more intimacy than I do. They're always gonna want more. Um, and so researchers just believe that these kinds of um, core beliefs uh, really play into each other nicely and, and that it's part of the attraction towards one another. I know it sounds so strange that we would be attracted to that, but that's what our researchers tell us and it's a really common relationship dynamic to be in. Sometimes we hear about this type of dynamic as like a codependent type of relationship um, and this relationship can feel like a kind of a roller coaster type of relationship with lots of highs, with lots of lows. Um, it can be pretty triggering, right? Your um, attachment alarm bell can be pretty activated. There can be lots of uncertainty about the future in this kind of relationship dynamic. And the research tells us that anxious and avoidant folks are less likely to resolve their conflict. They're gonna sweep that conflict under the rug. 
Um, so there are some challenges to this type of relationship. Um, we also know that um, for folks who have an avoidant attachment style, they, they almost see their partner uh, who has the anxious attachment style as like an enemy that just wants to get closer and closer and closer, right? Um, so there's some, there's some uh, challenging dynamics for um, this relationship combination. And I appreciate this uh, quote from Amir Levine who says, the trick is not to get hooked on the highs and lows and mistake an activated attachment system for passion or love. Don't let emotional unavailability turn you on. So yeah, a round of applause for that, right? <laughs> yeah. So for any of us in this space, if, uh, if this you know, applies to you, kind of being turned on by emotional unavailability, just something to really know about yourself and that pattern that you may be in. Um, and you know, kind of getting used to that roller coaster type of love, like it can be hard to then at some point move into a secure relationship because it might just be so stable, right? You might find it kind of boring. I, I miss those highs and those lows, right? So you kind of have to retrain yourself Okay, so we're gonna move into talking about how to support your specific attachment style. Are most people in this space aware of their attachment style? <laughs> yes, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So now that you know your attachment style, um, let's talk about how you can support your specific attachment style. So first of all, I think it's so important that we are compassionate towards ourselves, right? So number one, if you have an anxious attachment style, be self-compassionate. Um, focus on coming back to yourself. We can be so focused externally, so focused on finding a partner, on dating, on other people, right? We have to come back to ourselves. And one of the ways that we can come back to ourselves is our daily practices, you know? Like really focusing on, you know, self-care, on hobbies, on career stuff, on what makes you tick. Like, come back to yourself. Um, be aware of your anxiety, right? Someone with an anxious attachment style has anxiety. So notice when the anxiety is coming up for you. Notice um, what the quality of the anxiety is, you know, when it comes up, how it comes up. Get really familiar with your anxiety and understand how to ground your anxiety. Um, use techniques that help you specifically. You could go, you know, read self-help books or work with a therapist or look on therapy TikTok and find all sorts of strategies, right? But find the strategies that work for you specifically that help to ground your anxiety. Um, notice when you are being hyper-focused on your partner. Like, wow, I'm like so preoccupied by my partner right now. Just like say that to yourself, just notice it, right? Um, and then say, you know what, I'm gonna bring myself back. Like I'm so focused on my partner, I need to bring myself back to myself. Um, notice when you are abandoning yourself in some way in relationships, right? Many people do that at, at different times in their lives. It's like, I have this need, I'm repressing it because I wanna keep my partner, right? That's a form of abandoning yourself. Notice when you're doing that and set boundaries. I think for anxiously attached folks, setting boundaries is such a big part of this work. Um, asking for reassurance in your relationship. You may need reassurance. And that is okay. It is okay to ask for that. Get clear about your automatic behaviors and uh, particularly those protest behaviors. Like, which ones do you use, right? Notice when you're using one and like, notice when you're doing that indirect communication thing and say to yourself, oh, I'm using indirect communication. I actually have a need or I have a boundary or I'm scared about something, you know, and use that um, direct loving communication. And by the way, if you use that direct communication and your partner leaves and freaks out, that's okay, right? We're not meant to be with everybody. And um, if they're gonna leave because you have a need, like that's not your person, right? So it's, it's really about like finding safety and expressing yourself, um, even if it means like this might not be the relationship for me. Um, and then replacing those protest behaviors with direct communication. Okay, so for those of you who are identifying as avoidant, here are some strategies for you. First, 
strategy is the same one as the last uh, attachment style, self-compassion. I'm just going to keep coming back to this one. Be compassionate. This stuff formed when you were a baby. So be kind to yourself, right? Um, remind yourself that having needs in a relationship is okay. And in fact, it is healthy and it is important, right? So identify your needs, communicate those needs directly, and really work on revealing more about yourself. Share more about yourself. Express those feelings. Express those needs. Um, lean into your partner for support and nourishment. Right? All of this stuff may not come easily for someone with an avoidant attachment style, but notice the ways in which you can do it in your relationships. Be aware of those deactivation strategies that you subconsciously use to try to, try to create distance in your relationships. So what are those deactivation strategies? What do you do? Do you kind of get critical? Do you kind of um, distract yourself? Do you blame? Like, what are your deactivation strategies? And be aware that this attachment style is actually, you know, known for misinterpreting um, their partner's behaviors and affect, right? So if you have an avoidant attachment style, you're going to want to, like, check your assumptions about what's happening with your partner. Notice when your boundaries are overly rigid, right? Boundaries are oftentimes a very healthy thing. Um, sometimes for folks with an avoidant attachment style, their boundaries can be so rigid. Um, and it's like one thing if you have a non-negotiable in a relationship and it's like, no, this is my boundary and it's really important to me. But, you know, sometimes you have multiple partners who have different, you know, needs or boundaries and there's got to be some compromise and like, you know, like work on that emotional flexibility. Um, and then this is really important too, is just to emphasize those relationship benefits, really scan for the positives, what makes this relationship or relationships pleasurable and meaningful and helpful, right? So really leaning into that. Now, if anybody in this audience is in an anxious, avoidant type of relationship, here are some strategies for you. Number one, compromise. You're going to have very different attachment needs, right? One person's going to want more closeness. One person's going to want more distance. So compromise and talk about your different attachment styles and really kind of, you know, manage your expectations and practice acceptance. Um, it's so important to figure out how to soothe yourself when you get triggered because this dynamic can be very triggering. Focus on self-regulation, self-soothing, co-regulation, right? Ask your partner for co-regulation when it's possible and use that direct and loving communication when something comes up. Do not assume that your partner is a mind reader, right? That kind of moves us into this codependent category of things when we're just kind of guessing what's happening for our partner and acting in certain ways because we think that's what they're gonna want. It's like that, we wanna move out of codependency and we wanna be direct and clear and have these needs and boundaries um, and share them with each other. Disharmonies are an opportunity, right? And when I say the word disharmony, I mean conflict. Conflict is an opportunity in relationships. We have to retrain ourselves, right? I think so many of us think that conflict is the enemy, and it's like actually conflict is an opportunity to become closer, to understand each other more, to work through something difficult and come out on the other side. So if you are kind of notorious for sweeping things under the rug in your relationship, um, lean into disharmonies, right? And if you need help figuring out how to lean into disharmonies, um, take a nonviolent communication class. Work on reflective listening where you're listening to, listening to your partner and you are repeating back what they're saying so they feel heard and they do the same thing for you, right? Take personal responsibility. In most disharmonies, everyone involved can take some level of personal responsibility, right? Unless it's like an abusive dynamic, right? That's one thing. But in many different disharmonies, we can take personal responsibility and that develops a level of trust, you know? If my partner's like, you know, I did, I did do that thing. And you're like, wow, you just owned that. Like that, I feel safer. And I did this thing. Okay, then they can feel safer. Like own your stuff in disharmonies. I think I keep saying this, incorporate empathy and compassion, but I think it's just, it's just so important. Okay, 
So um, if you have a disorganized attachment style, in addition to that self-compassion, you may need some support to work on the abuse, the neglect, the, the trauma, the complex trauma that you experienced. Um, and there are very specific types of therapies that can help with complex trauma. Um, lean into dialectical behavioral therapy, lean into EMDR therapy, right? So these very specific therapies that can help you address the trauma that you experienced. If you've experienced this level of trauma, you may not feel a whole lot of safety in your body, right? So we need to come back to the relationship with ourself and feel a sense of safety in our bodies and, you know, really kind of heal that relationship that you have with yourself. Um, learn how to ground, nurture yourself, regulate your emotions, feel safety in your body. And you can do that with the, the support of a therapist. You can do that with the support of being out in nature or creativity or journaling. Um, it's also really essential if you have a disorganized attachment style to get skilled at knowing when you may be in an abusive relationship. So um, folks with disorganized attachment styles are more likely to kind of get into that space of an abusive relationship. So notice the signs, surround yourself with secure people as much as you can. Okay, so we are approaching the end of uh, this presentation. The last few things that I wanted to share with you um, is about earned secure attachment, right? So all the strategies that I shared that are very specific to each attachment style will help you move to earned secure attachment, right? So growing into that attachment style. Um, one thing that we talked about earlier is that, that the research tells us that making sense of your attachment history will move you one step closer to earned attachment security. Um, so if um, you were here at this presentation, which you are all here, you will be walking away hopefully with a greater sense of your attachment history, but it will be important for you to like really spend time reflecting with other people in your life, with a therapist, with a journal, and make sense of your attachment history. Um, really focusing on those daily practices and rituals that support your mental health, really deepening that relationship you have with yourself, um, focusing on that emotion regulation, managing your triggers is a really big thing, right? We should all be pretty aware of like the types of things that trigger us in our lives and we should have some strategies to be able to navigate those, those triggers. Um, that's gonna help us move towards more secure attachment in our life. Um, identifying a relationship role model can be really helpful. I think so many of us didn't have a relationship role model growing up, right? So there's lots of people that have experienced divorce or, you know, if their parents were together, um, maybe it wasn't the most healthy relationship, even if they, you know, stayed married, right? Like, so many of us don't have a, a role model to, like, you know, really think about um, that can support us with our own relationships. So, like, look at your life and see, like, do I have friends that are kind of, like, relationship role models? Is there somebody in the media that's a relationship role model? Is, you know, do I have family members? So look for those role models. And work with a, a therapist or dating coach on this stuff. You know, as we talked about earlier, you know, it takes on average four years to change your attachment style. So when I'm doing attachment-based work with clients, we are deep in their patterns, right? We're talking about who they're dating. We're talking about what's coming up and these, strat you know, the um, deactivating strategies, the activating strategies, the protest behavior. We are in the thick of that in therapy together. Um, and the hope is that slowly that person moves towards um, more uh, secure ways of interacting in their relationship. Be present with your partner. I, I think in the age of technology, we can be pretty distracted. Um, so really think about ways in which you can be more present with your partner. If you need to detach and go deep into your phone, um, can you communicate that to your partner? Like, hey babe, I need to go deep into my phone for the next three hours, but after that's done, do you wanna make dinner together? And then when it's dinner time, put your phone away and be present with each other. 
Because when we're distracted, you know, that can bring up all sorts of attachment, you know, wounding, and it doesn't feel very good. So I think we need to communicate more about how we can be present for each other and, you know, moments in which we need to, like, check out via technology, but just to be very clear about that. Tracking what's happening in each other's lives, staying curious about each other, even if you've been in a relationship with that person um, for a very long time. Let the other person know why they matter to you. I think we forget that sometimes, you know, like really practicing that gratitude about that relationship and expressing why you're grateful to be in that relationship. Support each other's growth and exploration. And I think this one's a really important one, just to know that not every relationship is meant to be an attachment-based relationship. So for those of you um, who are polyamorous, for example, maybe you're, you know, you date multiple people, you're in multiple relationships, um, you know, you may have one partner that you're like, this person meets my attachment-based needs, right? But this partner is really not available for that, so I'm not gonna even think of them in that kind of way. I'm not gonna put that on them. But I still like them, you know, and we can still, you know, go on hikes together and enjoy each other in these other ways, right? So we don't need to kind of put that on every partner. Um, and same thing with dating, you know? If you're dating, um, just be really aware, you know? This person's not gonna be able to meet my attachment needs. I can, I can just tell, you know? I can tell based on the communication, or I know that they're avoidant and I don't wanna do that again, right? It doesn't mean you have to stop dating them necessarily, you know? Like, you may still be able to hang out with them for a few months and enjoy each other, but to not put it on them, that they're gonna then be your attachment-based person who, you know, you'll be in a long, long-term relationship with. So get really um, clear about that. <clears throat> and I think this image is a really great one to kind of show, I think, you know, especially that bottom image of the two people, uh, two cartoon people, and one person really leaning in and the other person's like kind of avoiding it. It's like, yeah, Relationships, you know, we should be meeting each other in the middle and we should be compromising and really showing up fully um, in those, uh, you know, attachment-based relationships. So uh, really kind of looking out for that if you're, if you're dating. And um, just a few dating tips to leave you with. <clears throat> Express your needs early on when you are dating. I think that we have the perception that um, you know, we gotta kind of play it cool when we're dating. Um, but it's so important to just like be yourself, share what you need, what you're looking for. If you're looking to, you know, have kids or you don't wanna have kids or you wanna get married or you don't wanna get married, like say it. And if it scares the other person off, that is okay, right? They're not your person. I know I've said use direct communication like a thousand times in this presentation. So hopefully that's like a one, takeaway that we can all use, but even when you're dating, right? And also to move away from a deficit mentality. So thinking that, you know, there's really not a lot of people out there, you know? This one person I'm dating, that's my only shot. Um, the reality is, is there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people we could be with. There's a lot of soulmates out there for us, right? So move away from that deficit mentality. Pay attention to the signs of insecure attachment. Um, notice it, you know, when you're, when you're dating someone, um, notice through their behaviors, talk about attachment, and, and see what's coming up with the person that you're dating. Um, and just know, if you have insecure attachment, being with someone who has secure attachment may really put your um, attachment system at ease. Like, it really may help you feel safer in your body and in the relationship. So think about um, dating someone with a secure attachment style. Um, if you have anxious attachments, um, you may want to try dating multiple people at once um, so that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, you may also really want to take your time, you know, deciding who to be in a relationship with. Don't just jump in right away. Like, really notice, you know, is this person, do they have more of those secure tendencies? Are they a little more avoidant? Like, what's going on with this person? And, you know, really making an informed decision about whether or not it really makes sense to enter into this relationship. And sometimes we need to take a, a break from dating. 
So, you know, sometimes we need to come back to ourselves. You know, maybe I've been dating a bunch and it's, it's bringing up all this stuff for me and I'm noting all, noticing there's people who are emotionally unavailable and, it's, and, you know, it's like come back to yourself. Focus on your healing, work with a therapist, read, you know, therapy books, get on that, you know, uh, therapy TikTok, right? Um, and, and focus on your own healing um, for a time before you start again. Um, breaking up from a relationship. Sometimes we do need to break up from a relationship. And especially if we are deeply stuck in insecure patterns, right? And it's like, oh, we're doing the same thing over and over again. Like you, you can feel in your body that there is this you know, insecure pattern in the relationship. And maybe you've hit a growth wall. You know, maybe you tried different things. You tried direct communication. You tried therapy. You tried, you know, other, you know, approaches. And you just have hit a wall. And if the, the relationship dynamic literally feels like it is taxing on your body, you know, you're having that elevated heart rate and blood pressure and muscle tension. I mean, because really, you know, if you're in an unhealthy relationship, like, it can make you sick, right? Like, it, can, it really has a, there's a physical kind of response that we can have to being stuck in a pattern of unmet needs and this kind of attachment wounding. So, um, you know, sometimes we do need to break up. Breakups can be very activating if you have an anxious attachment style. So just know that if you're on the precipice of a breakup and you know you have anxious attachment, like you're really gonna have to be so sweet to yourself, you know, be your own inner best friend, you know, get support, know that it's gonna be hard. If you're dating someone that is avoidant, know that it's like a little more natural for them to break up, to leave. It might not seem as hard for them. So just kind of, you know, keep that in mind as you're engaging in this, if this is where you're at, or if you've been at this point in your life, you know, at some other point in time and you're just reflecting on this. Um, I think it can be really helpful when you're going through a breakup to kind of remember the, the negative parts of your partner. So this is something that avoidant folks tend to do. So this is kind of one of their strategies, their insecure strategies, but it, it can be a helpful way to um, help move on. And remember that, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to stay broken up. I'm not sure if anybody has ever experienced that dynamic where there's a whole back and forth right, especially if you're in an anxious avoidant dynamic, so um, really set those boundaries, right, so you can really get yourself out of that relationship. If you're really stuck kind of in the cycle of breakups and it's hard to get out, like, again, get support from a therapist to help, you know, hold you accountable and help you set those boundaries and get yourself out of that situation. Remember that humans are resilient and the grief will shift, so trust the grief, Trust the process. Focus on that relationship with yourself. I think I heard a woo. <laughs> okay, so here are my attachment takeaways. Everybody has a different capacity for intimacy, and that's okay. Your relationship needs are valid. Your relationship needs are valid. Your relationship needs are valid. Having deeper awareness about your insecure attachment origins and style can help you be less controlled by your automatic reactions. And I think that this point is really important to think about. Respond reflectively versus reflexively. This is sort of the key to working with this pattern stuff that we're talking about tonight. Um, so really like take a pause, you know, um, get that support before you react, right? Um, cultivate a loving relationship with yourself. I know that sounds so cheesy, but we all need to become our own inner best friends. We all need to work on our thoughts um, and really challenge those negative thoughts and bring in a more loving presence inside of ourselves. Um, Individual and couples therapy can really help, you know, so if you're in an anxious avoidant 
dynamic or you've got some sort of insecure dynamic happening, happening in your relationship, work with a couples counselor to help you move through those dynamics, work with an individual counselor to help you move through your stuff. Um, and lastly, secure and healthy relationships have the potential to help you feel more confident, soothed, peaceful, and live a longer life. So I just wanted to share some books with you that I thought you might find helpful because I don't think that um, this presentation is going to give you all of the relationship answers, although I tried my best to give you all of them. Um, these books, I think, can be very powerful, although one of these is a podcast. I talked a lot about Attached tonight. I highly recommend reading Attached. If you have an insecure attachment style, reading Insecure in Love. If you are polyamorous and you are trying to navigate attachment stuff in that kind of relationship structure, in a non-traditional relationship, Polysecure has some really great ideas about how to strengthen your relationships. The Smart Couple podcast is really awesome. Um, it's a podcast um, by a couple that are anxious and avoidant, and they're married and they have kids, and it's all about kind of how, how to navigate those dynamics. Um, Hold Me Tight um, by Sue Johnson, um, who brings in a, a type of therapy that helps couples move through attachment work. Uh, John Gottman's book. Um, John Gottman is incredible. I could do a whole presentation on him and his research. He's amazing. Look into John Gottman. Look into that book. Meeting in captivity, especially for those of you who are like, I am secure. I'm in a secure relationship. Well, sometimes we get in such a secure relationship, there's so much stability that we lose some of the desire. So I think Esther Perel's work, um, Mating in Captivity, is really helpful to cultivate more desire in your relationships. Um, and this book, Platonic, um, how the science of attachment can help uh, you make and keep friends, right? So looking at attachment and friendship, I think that's so sweet um, and important. And I also wanted to share this link and QR code to find your attachment style. Um, I will say this uh, test, this assessment, will kind of plop you into one of these categories um, if the majority of what you score like falls in that category. I think doing a paper assessment where you can actually see the breakdown of where you fall in between these categories can actually give you a more nuanced understanding of your attachment style. So you might consider um, getting the book attached, doing the assessment in there, um, but this is certainly a really great start. And this is my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that have come up for you today. Uh, that's my practice, Inner Awareness Therapy, uh, and uh, Beyond the Talk, which is um, our uh, sex ed for adults business that I do with Chris. And I just wanted to thank you so much for letting me nerd out about relationships and just tell you everything I know. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate you being here with me tonight on this journey, and I just wish you so well in your relationship with yourself and your relationships with other people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you. It was awesome. Uh, okay, so, the, oh, the house lights went up. I was about to say, this is the most challenging part of my evening when I have to find hands. Okay, so now questions. I'll take it here. And, and running. That's the other challenge. Hi, so I wanted to go back to kind of the beginning of your presentation on um, childhood attachment and the genetic components. Um, I was wondering if you're aware of any kind of studies around epigenetics with attachment itself because what's kind of interesting in regards to genetics is that um, two secure parents could raise an anx anxious um, relationship type individual and so I was just kind of curious if you've seen any studies around that. That is a fantastic question and I love uh, epigenetics and I'm so glad that you brought that up. 
Um, there are so many pieces of research in this body of attachment work, so I haven't seen anything specifically on it. Um, with that said, I would imagine that that exists because I think that you're right that trauma, you know, is passed down through our DNA and our genetics, and so yeah, you have may have parents that raise you in a kind of secure way, but maybe they went through a really traumatic experience in their lives, and they're passing it down through you, and it has an effect on you, or maybe. Yeah, that trauma shows up in how they're parenting you in some kind of way, even though they're secure in other ways. So I would imagine that epigenetics uh, would impact this. And now I'm going to have to dive into that research. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Thank you for your fabulous talk right here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So two quick uh, questions. One is. Um, also going back to the very start of your presentation, how much of the um, attachment style is um, sort of innate to the baby and how much of it could be attributed to the caregiver's style in, in the ultimate development of the particular attachment style? And secondly, are there particular areas of the brain that are more implicated, like I'm looking for a neuroanatomical correlate to attachment. Is there any such like the studies? Age? Yeah, is there, are there particular areas of the brain I mean, that are affected more than others? I would say that, that zero to um, seven year old brain is gonna be really much more affected. Um, and that 18 month to three year old uh, range, I think there's a lot happening with brain development and attachment. Um, does, does that answer that part of your question? Part of your brain. It's actually, and Chris and I were just talking about this earlier, it's like all, it's, it's multiple parts of the brain. Yeah, and you had another question, and that was the breakdown between Yeah, and Chris, maybe Chris and I were just talking about this research around genetics. Do you know the the percentage that genetics impacts um, attachment style? Yeah, it was. I mean, it's basically it, it's so it's like one. So caveat, like one study. So hold on tight, everybody. But like, it, there was this one study that said about forty five percent of I think it was avoidant attachment had some genetic deep. Uh, disposition and then like down to 20% for some of the other ones. So it's, it's still very malleable. There is some geni genetic predisposition. Stay tuned as researchers figure out more. Hello. Um, so I was curious, you talked a lot about um, the dynamics in a, a relationship where there's an anxious person and an avoidant person. Uh, has there been any research done or any writing done on what the dynamics are like in a relationship where both people are avoidant or both people are anxious? You know, that's a really uh, great question. And I, I've seen research about avoidance not dating other avoidance for very long because they're so, you know, focused on their independence. Um, and they're just much less likely to enter into a relationship together. So um, I would say that's, that's the research that I've seen around that. Um, I'm not totally sure about the like, statistics around anxious folks being with other anxious folks. We know that it exists. I just don't know like, how frequent that is. Um, that's a fantastic question. All right. Someone else? Wait, I lost the hands. Where'd they go? You still, there you go, okay. Do, 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 do. Hi, they're asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so looking at some of those things, I realized I've actually switched attachment style over the years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh wow, that's really interesting. Didn't, wasn't aware of that. And curious, um, any information on disorganized and disorganized pairing 
and the dynamics that might contribute to each other because you're looking at avoiding it connected with um, anxious and it seems that you know those pairings of going together it almost seems like disorganized and disorganized might have a relationship yeah I think that's a great question um, I think that and I haven't looked specifically at that research but based on my experience in my private practice um, and working with people in their attachment styles I think it's probably pretty common that disorganized people date other disorganized people, right? Because they've had similar experiences with trauma, childhood trauma, you know, they might feel really understood by somebody else who's experienced that level of trauma. Um, so I think that's probably, you know, relatively um, common. Um, I just, I think it's important for fo like disorganized folks, dating other disorganized folks, to really think about, you know, is this relationship healthy? Are there any abusive dynamics going on? Because we've got some pretty deeply rooted patterns and behaviors that are rooted in childhood trauma that we may be re recreating, because that's what we do. Um, so yeah, wonderful question, thank you. How different do attachment styles look to people with, say, ADHD or autism or OCD? You know, there's more research happening on disability and um, attachment styles, and I think that there's, there's more that is needed. Um, what I will say is I did see um, some research about folks with um, ADHD um, what if they're not reading being pretty triggering for, for a partner with an anxious attachment style. Um, and um, just, you know, that the, the uh, symptoms of ADHD, you know, can kind of replicate, um, you know, some of those insecure dynamics that like, you know, being distracted or, you know, focusing on other things or being withdrawn or, you know, kind of having your energy go in these different places and it can kind of um, be pretty triggering for someone with an anxious attachment style. So I think that there's more and more research happening um, around disability and um, yeah, I, I know that people are also wondering the same thing about autism and you know, how does that affect attachment styles and how does that affect a partner? And um, so yeah, I, I think it's a really fantastic question. Lee, I wonder if you could uh, speak a little bit about uh, any knowledge you know of the Enneagram and the attachment theory, if there's any correlations or any work that's being done there to help mix those two up and, uh, and get some determination from that. Yeah, gosh, you're all, you're all hitting me with really great questions. Um, I have not gone deeply into the Enneagram and, and that body of work and attachment, and I have not seen any research on that, um, but I would imagine that, that you know, your uh, Enneagram, you know, style, like, would have an impact on your attachment or your attachment would have an impact on your, you know, how you score for the Enneagram, so, um, yeah, I, I think that there's probably some sort of correlation there. I think that would make sense. Hi, thank you. Hi. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. So I had parents who were both anxious and avoidant. And when I took the test, I'm three out of seven avoidant, three out of seven anxious. Yeah. But I have three boys, two of them with disabilities, autism, ADHD. And so I learned regulation skills to teach them. So I found somatic therapy really helpful in what you're teaching. Like you really gotta, it's all in your head, right? But some of it is in your body and it's held in your body. So it's really, somatic is really important. I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for your plug on uh, for uh, somatic therapy because I think it can be extremely helpful for folks with insecure attachment styles in particular to like really come back to their bodies and feel safety in their bodies and connect with the breath and grounding and you know to be able to teach that to your your kids 
um, it, you know, is so important. Um, yeah, and you know, especially, I mean, I think this is true for like any young person that like parents and caregivers ideally should be teaching their kids how to ground, how to self-soothe. I mean, that's gonna help them move towards more secure attachment as they get older, if they can really learn how to self-regulate and get into their bodies. So thank you for sharing that, I appreciate it. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about the gender distributions across the attachment styles and how like social conditioning might kind of create some of those attachment styles, if you know anything about like how gender plays into this. You know, from what I have seen that, because I think there are some people that might think like, oh, are more cisgender men avoidant? Um, but the research that I've seen is that, it, you know, um, any gender can be any of these attachment styles. You know, it really is so dependent on your caregivers. Um, you know, with that said, the socialization that happens, it's like there's, there are other components, right? And I, um, I, I do want to highlight that, it, yes, it's like our caregivers have such an impact on our attachment styles, but, you know, there are other systems at play, you know, like messages that, you know, cis uh, boys get and cis girls get and, you know, messages we get about gender, you know, from the collective. And um, so, yeah, I think it's a really great question, um, but I do think that uh, any gender can be any of these attachment styles. It's really, uh, uh, it's very dependent on your caregivers. Thank you for asking that. All right, this question's pretty basic, and I can only assume it's to be present and loving with your children, but how can we contribute to a secure attachment uh, development in our children? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest components of that is being responsive to the many, many, many needs that little ones have. And it doesn't have to be perfect, you know? Um, if it can be 75% of their needs you are emotionally attuned to and you are responding to in a loving way, um, that is going to help them move towards secure attachment. Um, and soothing them, you know, really teaching them how to soothe by you soothing them, right? You're showing them, you're modeling that for them so that they can learn how to soothe themselves as they get older. Um, you know, getting, helping them get skilled at naming their feelings and their boundaries and their needs, even from the time that they're really little, you know, and not like shunning certain emotions, right? Like sometimes we say like, stop that crying or, you know, you need to knock that off, you know, because it's inconvenient for the parent, the caregiver. Um, but to like let your children have their emotions and really teach them, you know, how to name them, how to be with them, you know, how to soothe them, like to really be their emotional teachers um, from the time that they are really little, you know, can help them move towards secure attachment and feeling that sense of security with themselves first and foremost, you know, that inner secure attachment. Um, will really help them feel more secure in their friendships and, you know, dating relationships as they get older. So, yeah, thank you. So I remember uh, learning at one point that, um, kind of like you were saying, if the person who has an insecure attachment is in relationship with someone with secure attachment, not only can it calm their uh, attachment system, but also over time can help them move towards secure attachment themselves. Do you ever see it move the other direction, where the securely attached person is pulled yes. into an insecure attachment? I think that's a really, I'm so glad that you brought that up, because I meant to talk about that earlier, so thank you. Um, yes. So. Right, so dating someone, being with someone with a secure attachment style can raise your attachment frequency up. Um, with that said, if you have a secure attachment style, you can still be in an abusive relationship, right? So it's not like you're immune to this stuff. Um, also, you know, you don't typically fall 100% in the secure category. It's like you might mostly fall in that category, but then you've got 
an avoidant tendency here and an anxious tendency here. So if you have secure attachment, like you're not totally off the hook with this relationship stuff. Like it's still gonna be really important for you to continue thinking about secure attachment and how to strengthen it because yes, you can end up in a relationship that is unhealthy, that is abusive and you can be dragged down into a more insecure place and because you have that secure attachment style and you feel so dedicated to relationships and comfortable in them, you might end up staying longer than you should, right? So. Um, absolutely something to think about. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, and thanks so much once more for Leah, and thanks for sticking around. We will see you here, I believe it's in March at the Kiggins again, but we've got several events in between there. If you had a seven, eight, or nine, or 10, and you want a pint glass, come on up. And let's, uh, those of you who got those, uh, that 10 or those nines, if you want to potentially talk about getting those tickets to go to Beaverton, we really just want to make sure that somebody who can go to Beaverton will go to Beaverton with the tickets.